Hello and welcome to today's live webcast, Harvest More Responses After the Campaign. I'm Veronica Modarelli with ON24, the global leader in webcasting and rich media marketing solutions. We have just a few announcements before we begin today's presentation. This webcast is designed to be interactive between you and the presenters. I would like to bring your attention to the presentation window. To the left, there is an area in which you can submit questions at any time during this webcast. Simply type in your question inside the box and click the Submit button above it. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation to respond to your questions. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. To enlarge your slides, click on the Enlarge Slide button also located to the left of your presentation window. Should you require technical assistance, please click on the Help button. After the webcast, you will receive an email from ON24 with a link to the archive of this webcast. By clicking on the archive link, you will be able to view the webcast again, download the slides via PDF, or listen to the audio via podcast. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Jason Stewart leads demand generation programs for Demandbase and is the lead contributor for Demand Blog dedicated to best practices in B2B demand generation. A recognized thought leader in the B2B lead generation and lead management space, Jason founded and leads the Salesforce.com user group in San Francisco and has spent 10 plus years in B2B telesales, demand generation, lead management and marketing operations. Andrew Gaffney is editor and publisher of Demand Gen Report, an e-media publication focusing exclusively on the strategies, tactics, and measurements that are central to generating growth. A 20-year veteran of B2B publishing, Gaffney has served as an editor and publisher for several different business magazines, including This Week in Consumer Electronics, Sporting Goods Business, Consumer Goods Technology, Retail Info Systems, Hospitality Technology, and Mobile Enterprise. And now I'd like to turn the presentation over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Veronica. Welcome, everybody. As Veronica mentioned, we launched Demand Gen Report last year to address what we refer to as the demand imperative. Over the past three to four years, the sales funnel has become increasingly challenging for companies, particularly in the B2B sector. The deals have taken longer to close, and there are more people involved in the decision-making process. In response to this, most companies have put together a much greater emphasis on lead generation as a whole. In the early phases of this process, companies are purely focused on generating as many leads as possible. But as they get more advanced, marketers have realized that demand generation is really a closed loop process and requires a great deal of measurement and analysis. <laughs> as companies get more sophisticated in their demand generation efforts, one of the most common learnings is the importance of sales nurturing or harvesting through a campaign, as we'll be referring to today. Now, if you're struggling with sales nurturing or it's a new concept to you, you're not alone. 73% of companies today admit that they have no process for requalifying leads. A lot of the leads that come in and don't aren't responding to campaigns typically, unfortunately, are ignored at this point. Eight studies and research have consistently shown that just because a prospect doesn't respond to one campaign or isn't ready to buy in this quarter, it shouldn't be removed from the marketing process, but they are likely to respond further down the pipeline. The number of touches it takes will vary by industry, but research has consistently shown that it does take multiple touches before a prospect simply responds. Some complex industries that we've shown here in high tech. With a, typically with high price tags, it can take us as many as 9 to 11 different touches. So again, simply sending out one email campaign and feeling like somebody didn't respond isn't a prospect. Typically is a mistake. So looking at it from a buyer's point of view, everyone knows everyone's business. How busy everyone is today. Um, buyers are looking for different, very specific kinds of information depending on where they are in the buying cycle. Um, someone that's the very early consideration phases may not respond to a very specific kind of offer or 
depending on the kind of medium it's served. But again, that doesn't mean that they may not be interested in another offer next week or next month. A recent study from Knowledge Storm and Marketing Sherpa found that 61% of technology buyers were looking for content that directly addressed the issue they faced at different points in the decision process. Frequency is also a key. I mean, people worry that they're badgering people and sending too much information, but buyers have actually said that they're looking for multiple multiple kinds of information, multiple pieces of content. That is marketing Sherpa sure, knowledge storms for study found eighty five percent, really high number, we're looking for at least three different kinds of content. And again, that could be a web seminar at one point, it could be an email, it could be a white paper, depending on the kind of content that you're and the issues you're looking to address. A multimedia contact strategy is also proven successful for most marketers. No no one medium is working in today's world. Um, the, the kind of topic you may be addressing could lend itself very well to a webinar, something that needs to be visual and complemented by slides. It's a little bit more detailed and research-based white papers tend to work well. But again, no single medium should be should be the anchor of a campaign. Research is consistently showing that multiple types of campaigns and multiple touches are, are generally the way to go. Sales nurturing, again, as I referred to, marketers are building nurturing campaigns that, that integrate all these different types of campaigns. And the approach can be consistent depending on whether it's, a, it's an email or a web seminar. Uh, the, the audience you can be going after can complement each other, but again, a multi-touch, multi-campaign has, has proven the most effective. What I thought I would do now is, is actually walk you through just some sort of the basics of a, camp, of a campaign process, a cold closed loop process. Some of this will be basic to you, but again, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page before I turn it over to Jason and walk through some of the, the trends that are developing as far as building campaigns. So we'll start off with the setup process. And obviously this is when you're going to select your list and decide what the offer or creative that's going to go with it. Um, what I'm finding here is the trend at this phase of the campaign is that people are tending to be a lot more segmented, targeted, and specific with who they're going after, what the offer is, and who the list is that they're pulling. Um, you know, the old way of, of just trying to grab as many names, you know, renting a big list and then just hoping you get whatever lead you get from it. Um, is becoming less effective. People are, are finding they get better response rates, better conversions when they uh, take the time to select the right list, go for the right titles, try to get as much information about the role of the, of the person that they're going after and make sure the offer is relevant. Those are some of the keys that I would suggest for people at this phase. Obviously, the execution after you have your selects and you have your segments of who you're going after you know, the, some of the basics here, making sure that you know, you're able to measure and get it out in, in, a, in a format and with a vendor that uh, is reliable and is going to give you good reporting and, and you make sure that you're going to reach through and the campaign gets through to the people you want it to. Um, obviously, timing is critical here in terms of that it aligns with what you're trying to accomplish and also what the vendor, what your potential buyers and prospects are looking to accomplish. Now, again, this is when, when marketers tend to be a little bit more mature in the process, but, you know, again, that, that initial phase is just trying to generate as many leads as possible. And what people are finding to really be effective is that it really requires a lot of analysis after the campaign is complete, going back, finding out who responded to the campaign, what kind of click-throughs you got, what kind of conversions, uh, what, what kind of reporting you have available. Uh, advanced marketers are really you know, investing in this, trying to, to do detailed analysis of, you know, how, why, and who responded to each campaign and what kind of learnings they can take from it. And again, that's, you know, in terms of the closed loop process, those parts are really critical. So what, what Jason's going to address here today before I turn it over to him, the phase of you know, the closed loop, you'll see some of the positive results where, okay, we, we targeted this prospect at XYZ company and he did respond and now we've turned it over to the sales team and we've got a couple of follow-ups planned. But one of the keys that we're, we're focusing on today is the lost opportunities. So as you've gotten through the analysis phase and, and you've found that you know, maybe 100 companies didn't respond, um, you know, don't neglect them. There's some key things that you can do and should do with the opportunities that maybe did not respond to a specific campaign or effort. Um, and with that in mind, I'd like to I'll turn it 
turn this over to Jason. And he's got some specific suggestions for us and some background on how to approach that phase. Thanks, Andrew. When, when, when we were talking about this webcast and what we were going to try to accomplish in this webcast, you know, what really struck me was how easy it was to find content on those first three steps. Um, the creation of the, of the campaign, the, the creative, the, the finding the list, the uh, ability to, to discover some vendors that are going to help you uh, really send out those emails and, and, and monitor the responses that come back and uh, just the analytics that are out there. More and more vendors are, are coming out there with really great analytics tools right out of the box to help you do your job better. But one thing that I've struggled with is, you know, sort of drowning in that, that sea of data and what do we actually do with the results? How do we classify the, uh, the, 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 the people that have responded, that haven't responded? You know, what are we going to do with all of this information that, that is becoming more and more readily available? So some of the goals of this webcast, you know, first and foremost, we want to talk about uh, cultivating and nurturing those responders. Uh, this is probably the easiest step. It's probably the one that you're doing already because, as you probably know, the sales teams are always very anxious to get those lists of the people who registered for that webcast or downloaded that white paper. Those are the, the calls that they want to make first. Uh, sometimes, you know, and, and it could be a subject for another webcast, uh, it, it's not the right time to, to give those, those names to sales. They still need a little bit more qualification, but regardless, they, they want those names. Uh, next goal is to get those non-responders and non-registrants engaged and interested, which is very important simply because most of the people that you're going to market to for this campaign aren't going to reply, aren't, aren't even going to open your email. Uh, finally, let's turn those non-attendees, those bounced emails, those unsubscribes to your advantage. Let's, let's turn those lemons into lemonades and hopefully by following some pretty straightforward advice on how to best handle those first three steps, we're going to find some lost opportunity. So right off the bat, uh, let's sort of run through this process by creating a campaign and talking about how we're going to run the campaign and why, why we're going to choose this particular campaign. And I was thinking that we would do uh, a webcast, uh, which is... Honestly, it's one of my favorite types of campaigns to run and to promote. And it's, it's really in line with just the idea that you really need to create more content that your prospects are going to be interested in. I, I was at a, uh, a breakfast uh, seminar this morning put together by B2B Magazine, and, and one of the speakers was talking about how important it is to create more content that's going to be interesting to your prospects because more and more, people tune out at what is being thrown at them. You know, they have their TiVo at home that lets them fast forward through all the commercials. When they drive into work, they hook their iPod up to their stereo and they, so they don't listen to any of the commercials on the radio. And then when they get into work, theoretically, a lot of the junk mail, a lot of the advertisements that are going to get pushed at them through email are going to get filed out right via the spam filter. And they're not going to see uh, these these. These, these items that are broadcast them on a daily basis. They need to be engaged. They need to be engaged with content that's interesting to them right now. And I, I particularly like webcasts because webcast leads are so valuable, uh, particularly versus, say, you know, a, a white paper. I, I like to, to sort of use the analogy. Uh, there's a store out here on the West Coast called Trader Joe's. And whenever I go to Trader Joe's, they always have a ton of free samples in the back of the store. And all out of the time I take it, regardless of whether I really like it, like it or not, just because it's free. Now, every once in a while, this is not to say that you're not going to strike gold every once in a while. Uh, you're you're going to get that person who gets that free sample and just thinks it's the most fantastic thing ever and they're going to end up buying the, 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 the product. But um, I think a, a better analogy, you know, if, if, if you look at a webcast, it's more like a cooking class. You know, if someone takes the cooking class with you, um, they've committed time to, to do the cooking, and if they like the, the product, the, the, the final output of the cooking class, they're more likely to buy the ingredients that are going to be involved in making that recipe correctly. So when you, when you think 
about that, and, and when you think about all of the, the different opportunities that you get in a webcast to, to touch these people, um, you should be sending an email invitation to them, you know, two or three times. Um, it gives, which gives you the opportunity and, 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 and a very good reason to send an email to them promoting this event, promoting your company three times. Then there's the actual event where you're engaged with people and the people who actually come and, and, and you know you have some registra registrations, you have the people that actually attend. The ones that actually attend and have committed that time to, to spend it with you, they're, they're very good prospects. And the next best thing that I like about webcasts as a campaign medium is the ability to utilize that archived presentation as sort of the gift that keeps on giving. Um, you know, you can promote it via email campaigns, you can put it up, a link to it up on your website, and, it, and it's content that, that's all going to be out there. So since those webcast leads are so valuable, response handling, how you handle, say, the email campaign results that, that you get back after you send out your promotional email. Um, it's critical. Uh, you need to be able to track those registrations. Uh, you need to be able to, to email those registrants the, the login information. You need to be able to track the people who actually show up to the presentation. Uh, and you need to be able to email archived presentation access to them. And it can be pretty overwhelming. Um, I like ON24, uh, our, our, our host today, because it is a turnkey solution. I always, when I try to utilize other vendors, that, and I would have to do the recording on my own. I was always really stressed about that. Am I going to do the recording right? Um, it, I spent a lot of time testing it, retesting it, and I was always having uh, a panic attack that I wouldn't be able to get the recording because that archived uh, version of, of the webcast was so valuable. But anyway, we, we've gotten the, the, the content together for this email campaign uh, promoting the webcast. We're going to send it. We're going to track it. We're happy with the, the creative. It's out. It's gone. And the results are in. So, uh, oh, first of all, make sure you use a good provider when you're sending out these email campaigns. Uh, you know, deliverability is key. Um, you want to choose a reputable provider who, who takes care to make sure that they only work with with uh, reputable clients, um, so that, uh, that their deliverability is going to be better, and, and that they're going to have the analytics uh, after the fact to be able to provide you with the list of the bounces and of the opens and of the registrations. But if they integrate with the CRM system that you use, you know, even better. But the results are in, and we got these registrants. Uh, the messaging worked. Now we have to, to make sure they attend. We need to email them reminders before the event. We need to email them recording access if they miss it. Um, the ones who actually attend the webcast, you know, they're your prime candidates because they actually committed the time. The ones who, but the ones who registered to go um, but didn't necessarily attend are almost as valuable because they were obviously somewhere within the process of, of needing to, to learn more about what your product or your service does. Uh, next up is, is you have your clicks and your open. Uh, you know, these people were interested but didn't commit. You know, this is a no-brainer. This is stuff that you're, you're probably doing already because, as I said, your salespeople are, you know, hot to trot to get this list of, of the clicks and opens. But the bottom line is they were interested but didn't commit. Why not? Was it the timing? Um, was there, you know, something they were interested in but they just couldn't make it at that particular time of day? You know, all the more reason to make sure they get access to the recording. Was there not enough information in the invitation? Um, maybe you should place them up as a, as a high priority person to call before the webcast, saying, hey, you know, I, uh, uh, we have this webcast coming up. Uh, I, I thought of you. Thought it might be something that you're interested in, and, and, and feel them out a little bit more. Uh, maybe there was some sort of concept that they were hoping to see that wasn't necessarily in this webcast that you can can put into some other campaign at a later date, or, or maybe you can make them some kind of special offer, uh, do a special email or uh, offering advanced access to the recording um, before it goes live on the website. Next up is the non-responders. You know, these are the people, it's, it's going to make up the vast majority 
of your campaign target list. And remailing to these people is absolutely critical. Um, I was talking to, to Veronica at On24, and, and she indicated that the vast majority of the registrants that they get for their webcast happen within the last 10 days. And at the, the company I was with uh, before I joined Demandbase back in June, um, we did a, a webcast in conjunction with uh, an online publication. Um, and they indicated that they, as a rule, always send out at least three invitations for any kind of seminar, web seminar that, that they run. And that the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of registrations that they get for their, their webinars come on the third try. So in order to talk about non-responders and what, what we're going to do to them, let's, let's talk about some of the reasons why they might be non-responders. I read a white paper recently from uh, an email vendor named uh, Bronto Mail. Uh, you can access the, the web paper at bronto.com in their service section. And the, the name of the email was, of the white paper was remailing, targeting those that don't open. And they highlighted five of the main reasons that people don't open your email, don't even give it a second glance. And, and number one, of course, was volume. Their inbox is full with an increased reliance on those spam filters that I mentioned earlier to you know, weed out the stuff that they're not interested in. Um, they're, they're not even seeing a lot of the emails because they've taken steps to, to, to curb the volume um, that they're getting into their inbox. And as a result, um, you get a very short shot at consideration. Um, you, you get that subject line, um, maybe a, a, a brief glance at the content. You know, it's, it's, people are just overwhelmed, and, and, and volume is, is really important. Uh, next up was the subject line. Now, you're going to run with the subject line in the email that, that you like, the one that you're gonna, you, you think is going to work the best. And the first time you, you send out that invitation to the webcast and you get those people that opened it or clicked on it or even registered, um, the, the, the subject line worked for them. Uh, but that subject line isn't going to work for everybody, which is why you need to sort of play around with the content, try different subjects. You have you know, hopefully at least two to three chances to, to reach these people and get them engaged in the uh, webcast and, and get them to register for the event. I hope you're not sending uh, multiple emails with exactly the same subject line because you might be shooting yourself in the foot there. Uh, from name, who, who the heck are you? Um, I, I've tried lots of different things when I, I've sent out uh, email invitations to, to webcast. I, I might put uh, demand-based webcasts or demand-based marketing. Ultimately, what I found works the best for me is when I just put my my name in there. Um, people, uh, but you know, it, what, what works best for me might not work best for you. But that from name, if people have no reason to recognize you, your odds of getting opened are are, are even lower. Uh, content, content is is extremely important. Did your content uh, in the email, did it match the list of people that you sent it to? Andrew mentioned before how it's becoming more and more important uh, to become very targeted in who you select to invite to this webcast. You know, if it's, an, if it's a webcast about marketing best practices, don't send it to every single person in your list. Send it to the people who are involved in marketing because they're the ones who are going to be interested. Um, was the offer compelling? Was it more than a pitch? Was it more than just a, an offer to, do, to demonstrate your product? Uh, I've, I've gotten uh, invitations to webcasts before, which were basically just going to be glorified product demos. And if I really wanted a product demo, um, I, I would call the uh, I would call the vendor personally and, and, and try to arrange something around my schedule where I'm going to get the personal attention and the um, focus on the features and the benefits of, of the product or service that I think are most important. Uh, I really have no inclination to, to register for a webcast just a glorified product demo. You know, again, t talking about that, that content question, when I was at that uh, breakfast seminar this morning, I, I was talking to, well, I was, uh, I was listening to was a guy by the name of Scott Anderson who's the VP of marketing at, at Lewis Packard, and they had this content um, campaign called Change Drivers. And 
they took a really B two C approach and, and it made it work in B two B. They they created content that's interesting to their prospects, and their prospects would come back regularly to uh, get updates on on new episodes of this Change Drivers series. Uh, that's that's a great example of of the kind of webcast or or, or the kind of content that you want to create. Something that's interesting to the people that you market to. Don't make it just about you. Make it about the issues that everyone uh, is, is interested in. Everyone that you market to is interested in, on a whole, uh, if you can find it. Um, but specifically, you know, this this content question just could just go on and on and on. But you know, I want to give an example of you know also how you just lay out the content is so important. Here's an example of, of an email that I got last week where my uh, Outlook images have been enabled. Uh, it's, this is the way, the exact way that they wanted me to see this email. And when I look at it this way, you know, I, I actually looked through it and I found one or two articles that were interesting to me and I actually clicked on one. However, the first time I saw it, was on my BlackBerry, and this isn't going to, I wasn't going to give this a second chance. Um, I found that those templates that we worked so hard to create, uh, you know, as, as more and more people, the, the first time that they look at that email is going to be on a portable device, on a BlackBerry or a Trio or, or an iPhone or, or what have you. You need to take the steps to make sure that your content is, is even visible to people. Uh, if you're going to use a template, and I, and I recommend that you do, uh, maybe think about instead of having that banner up at the top, maybe put that banner with the images down a little bit lower and put the content up higher so that if someone's looking at it on their BlackBerry, the first thing that they see isn't going to be a, a, a URL that's eight lines long. It's going to be some content that is interesting to them that's going to engage them and make them read on a little bit further and put up with that eight line long URL and keep scrolling down. Finally, too busy. You know, just combine a heavy workload with the volume of, of email that they're getting. Uh, you, you, you've got an uphill battle. But those are, are the main, the five main things that, the five main reasons that that non that people don't open your email that they're that they're non-responders. Just make sure you keep emailing them. But uh, I believe coming up next we have a poll that Veronica wants to take over. Thanks. The first poll question is, what do you typically do with your list of bounced email addresses? Please select one. You can choose from nothing, rely on my email service to remember them, update my CRM, then forget it, update my CRM, then investigate. So select one of those answers by clicking on the radio button below it, and then click on the submit answer button. And while we're waiting for these poll results to come in, I'd like to remind everybody that you'll be receiving an email from ON24 within 48 hours of the conclusion of this webcast with a link to the archive. By clicking on the archive link, you will be able to view the webcast again, download the presentation slides as a PDF, or listen to the audio via podcast. And please feel free to share the archive link with a colleague or a friend. So we're getting some results in here. and. Um, they're looking pretty interesting. I'm going to push them out to you, Jason. Okay. Okay, 22% don't do anything with their list about email addresses. 33 rely on their email service to remember them. Um, 33 update their CRM and then forget it. 11 update their CRM and then investigate. This is actually pretty much in line with, with what I expected. Uh, I mean, I, I myself... Uh, you know, with the bounced email addresses, uh, it also I think it also really depends on on the size of your organization and if you have the the resources to follow up on those bounced emails. What do you think, Andrew? Yeah, as you said, I think it's about what you'd expect. But I'm actually slightly encouraged that uh, almost half are, are doing you know, some kind of updating in their CRM, which which would hopefully increase the odds that we'll get that addressed at some point. Or maybe at, at the very least, those people will be excluded from uh, future email campaigns, and you can save a couple of dollars on <laughs> on mailing fees, huh? Right, or um, for the telemarketing aspect you suggested. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so that's that's really interesting, Veronica. But let's get back into the slides. Um, to begin with, when, when we're going to talk about how to handle the bounces um, from our email campaign promoting our webcast, uh, let's talk about churn rates and, and attrition a little bit first. You know, 40% of email users, users change their email address at least once every two years. You know, it, it goes on and on 15%. Change it to one or more times a year, and the average churn rate is 21%. Uh, according to email Sherp, Marketing Sherpa's email marketing benchmark marketing survey, uh, you know, you're looking at, at, at 20 out of every 1,000 emails in your house list. Becoming useless every month. So, uh, bouncing uh, your your email campaign. You know, honestly, I consider these bounced emails as a golden opportunity to not only update my data, but to also give my sales team uh, a, a great new opportunity and a great new reason to to, to call um, these. People, you know, they can they can look through the bounce list. They can find, you know, the companies that are that are highest on their priority, and they can give them a call and say, you know, hey, we have this incredible webcast plan that I think you're going to be interested in. But and I tried to to alert you to it uh, via email, but your email bounced. Can I get that updated? Uh, can I tell you about that webcast? Or maybe that person's not even there anymore. It's a great way to open the door um, to say, hey, you know, is is Steve still there? He's not. I I. Notice that my email bounced, and I had this incredible opportunity. This webcast, can I talk? Who, who's replacing Steve? Can I talk to? Can I, oh, can I talk to her? So, this is a, a great opportunity to prioritize um, your most important target prospects, and and give the sales team the opportunity to, to and, a, and a great reason to call. Uh, also, if you want to consider the the type of bounce, if possible, if you have the opportunity to, to figure out if it's a hard bounce or a soft bounce, meaning um, you know maybe their email inbox was full, maybe you know there was something just kind of funky uh, with uh, with the content of the email, maybe uh, you know, your your reply to address didn't match the, the send from address. You know, there's there's a lot of different reasons why your email just won't get delivered. And those bounces that, that come back right away, they're your hard bounces. They're the, the email addresses that are probably not valid anymore. But you might find some that are soft bounces that you didn't find out they were bounces until maybe two, three days after your campaign. Try a direct email. Try, try sending an email directly to them out of your Outlook. Maybe that will be the secret weapon to, to, to get your content into their inbox. Uh, you know, that's maybe give them a call. Um, Another uh, another thing to consider is, is an alternate campaign. Uh, I was at, as Veronica mentioned at the, at the beginning of the webcast, I'm the I'm very involved in the, in the Salesforce.com community here in San Francisco, and I was at their annual user group convention, uh, not user group, uh, their annual user conference uh, back in September, and I was talking to uh, Janine Popik, who's CEO of uh, of a uh, email company that I. I really enjoy working with called Vertical Response, and, and she had mentioned this great strategy that some of her winery clients utilize, where whenever they send out an email campaign, they take their list of bounces, and they send a postcard to every single one of those bounces. Um, here's an example of one of the postcards that they send. We've been having trouble reaching you. Don't miss the next exclusive offer. And on the back, it says, you signed up to our e-list to hear about special offers, events, and news, but we haven't been able to reach you at our email address. In just a few weeks, we'll be offering our Napa Valley Petit Syrah only 125 cases of this wine were bottled. This is sure to be a popular selection and will sell out quickly, and then it prompts them to update their information so that they can learn about this next exclusive offer. You know, and <laughs> this is a, a B2C tactic, but I think it's just tailor-made for, for B2B. Um, you know, it, it gets if, if that person that you were marketing to, that that person whose email address bounced, you know, if they're not there anymore, your postcard's going to get it to their replacement fan, and, and it might prompt them. You know, if there's a, a compelling offer, if there's a very good reason for them to provide their information to you, uh, then you're going to get it, and your database is going to get updated, and you're going to have a brand new prospect to talk to about your product or your service. So, you know, when, when Janine told me about this example and how much success her winery clients you know, have with it. I, I just thought it was fantastic. Oh, I, I pushed to the poll back. Veronica, there's a no poll problem. Veronica. 
Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Our next poll question is, what do you typically do with your list of unsubscribed email addresses? Again, select one from nothing, rely on my email service to remember, update my CRM, then forget it, update my CRM, then investigate. So select just one of those and then uh, click on the Submit Answer button right below. And while these polls results are coming in, I'd like to remind everyone that we'll be having a Q&A session at the end of this slide presentation. So please submit your questions. Simply type your question inside the box to the left of your presentation window and click the Submit button above it. And if we don't get to respond to your question during the Q&A session, we will forward the questions to the speakers, Jason and Andrew, and they will answer you individually via email. So get those questions in. And so we've got some interesting results here, and I'm pushing them out to you, Jason. Okay. This is, is exactly what I was expecting, and it's, it's for the most part what I, I would do for a long time. Sixty-two percent of you simply rely on your email service to remember. Um, which means that you're not updating it in your CRM. And when you switch providers, um, you might be emailing to people who have unsubscribed from your list um, in, a, in a previous incarnation. Uh, Andrew, what do you what do you think of these results? Yeah, they seem about in line, and I think it goes back, Jason. You know, not only to the uh, importance of your CRM system, but you know, as you've pointed out a few times, I think unsubscribes can can also be like bounces, can be for a number of reasons. I, I building my own circulation, have found some of them have been mistaken on subscribes. And, well, doing some kind of follow-up, at least tracking them, I think is, is an absolute necessity. Oh, yeah. And, um, Veronica, can you bring us back into the presentation? Uh, if you utilize a, a CRM vendor, are we going the right way? Backwards. You should be going to unsubscribe. Uh, sorry about that. I'll get it for you. Um, hopefully, you're, you're utilizing a vendor, uh, an email vendor, that uh, will automatically update your CRM system with those unsubscribes, so that if you do happen to change, you can you can carry it over. Um, you know, but ultimately, you know, I like to sort of refer to the unsubscribes as 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 the lost ones. You know, these are the people that you know if, if as more and more companies rely so heavily on email marketing um, and exclusively email marketing, these unsubscribes just become a, a, a lost commodity. But the thing you need to remember about their unsubscribing um, is, is, is don't take it personally. I'm in trouble. No problem. Um, you might need to, to push the slides. Sure. Don't take it personally. Uh, next. Don't think that they're not interested. And and finally, uh, don't stop marketing to them. Remember the, the issues about volume and about workload. Uh, just because they don't like to be marketed to via email doesn't mean that they're not a prime prospect for your product or your service. You need to keep marketing to them. You just need to find alternate ways to market to them. If you're having this webcast, Pull a list of the unsubscribes, hand it over to sales, and say, hey, these are some of our prospects. Find the ones on this list that are your top prospects that you want to make sure get to this webcast, and you make sure that you call them and tell them about it, because otherwise they're not going to get an email about it, and there's no guarantees that they're going to be able to, that they're going to hit the websites that we might be advertising on, or that they subscribe to any of the lists that we might rent to, to promote it. Um, you know, ultimately, don't stop marketing to these people just because they've unsubscribed from your list. Um, because it doesn't mean they don't like you. It just means they don't like to be um, marketed to via email. So in summary, celebrate your registrations and take care of your registrants and attendees because they're so valuable. Find out why your opens didn't convert. Call them. Talk to them. Find out what sort of content they are interested in. It can be sort of marketing intelligence as well as generating more registrations for your current event. Uh, mail these people, I think, at least three times uh, for your webcast. Try different content. Try to find the messaging that's going to work. 
Um, because as you know, the vast majority of the people that you're marketing to don't respond. Next, treat that bounce list as a high priority calling item. And finally, don't forget to market to your unsubscribe. So that's it. In summary, I think we can move on to the Q&A. Are there any questions out there? Thank you, Jason and Andrew. And so our first question, and by the way, we have a short survey that I'm going to push out to the audience right now during our Q&A so that people can take a little time to answer our, our survey while we go through Q&A. So um, here's the survey, and here is our first question from Regina. I'm a marketing consultant and contractor to mainly the B2B manufacturing and distribution industries, but I am seeing an increasing overlap in these segments with B2C. Can you cite the main similarities, differences in how to structure an in initial email communications piece to maximize the best of both? You know, I, I touched on this um, a little bit earlier, and I think that with the, with the amount of content um, and the amount of information that, that the B2B marketplace gets inundated with every day, uh, you need to make sure that the content that you're sharing with these people is something that's going to be interesting to them because uh, it's, it's becoming an on-demand world. And uh, if you create content um, that is not only managing to promote your product, promote your service, but also provide them with some information uh, or some background that's going to help them do their jobs on a day-to-day -day basis, they're, they're going to begin to respect you. They're going to remember you. And um, they're going to think of you when they are um, in, a, in a buying mode. Uh, what do you think, Andrew? Yeah, I think you know, we're seeing a similar trend where there's <clears throat> some sectors now that are being referred to kind of as hybrids where they're you know, maybe traditionally were viewed as more of a B2C or more of a B2B. I think you know, financial services comes to mind. Um, I think some of the uh, nuance there is, is the complexity of the product that you're trying to sell or service that you're offering, and also the price point. Um, obviously, somebody that's, that's going to make a uh, six-figure investment in, in a, it's something that could be, you know, whether it be a uh, mutual fund or a piece of software, um, you know, typically it's going to take more time and education than uh, you know, buying a $50 consumer item. So I think um, the, the expectation and the buying cycle uh, needs to be factored in, and there, there are some similarities and some big differences between uh, B2B messaging there and B2C. But again, just to reiterate what Jason said, be, it's really critical that the offer and the content be relevant, um, compelling, and hopefully leading to you know, an ongoing discussion. You know, and hopefully you're targeting the right people. Um, I mean, when you, when you look at the B2C space, they've had these demographics down for, for decades. They know exactly um, the age, gender, uh, hair color of the, of the person that is, is going to be most interested in their product. Um, so the, the days of just blanketing your, your entire house list with every single offer that comes along are over uh, because your response rates are going to be abysmal. Um, you're going to get uh, labeled as a spammer. You're going to get tons of unsubscribes from, from people who, who are receiving content that's not relevant to them. Um, uh, one thing that I would, I would really recommend doing is, is spending some time looking at your house list, looking at your database, figuring out how um, you, can, you can sort of build some, some areas. You know, uh, maybe run a report that, that shows everyone that has marketing in their title um, and make sure that the, the, the department field uh, for, for that contact is filled in with marketing so that you can target specific campaigns specifically to marketers. Just you need to be very focused and very targeted on who you send your content to and don't send it to people who aren't interested. Thank you. Our next question is from Gabriel. Is there a point of diminishing returns? When should I cut bait and focus on the next campaign versus squeezing blood out of a rock? Well, I think that um, if you're not going to follow up on the campaign, um, then it, it's, it's kind of a big question mark why are you running the campaign in the first place. Now, obviously, you can't just um, give your sales team the, the bounce list and expect it to be their number one priority for all eternity. You, you need to have some realistic expectations. You know, 
don't don't expect them to call the entire bounce list. Uh, expect them to, to call the ones that are the people that are most interesting to them within that bounce list. Um, spread the wealth around. Let people know. Let, let let the team around you know what you're doing and what your goals are, uh, and how they can benefit by helping you accomplish those goals. And 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 draft those people to help you do it. You know, but obviously. Don't spend more time following up on the campaign than you did creating the campaign in the first place. Um, use your own best judgment is, is, is my advice. Yeah, I would, I would add, Jason, too, that I think a lot of the uh, sort of advanced marketers in this space have some internal metrics. So you know, part of the, that initial response and the analysis you do, you know, use it to measure how the campaign is and how effective it was. So if in general you just got really poor response rates, then obviously you may want to put more, less, you know, follow-up time to that. But if you, if you did find that some pockets of 20% of this uh, people did respond, so that the campaign must have had some resonance, let's just focus on why these people didn't get it. So I think it leads back to sort of campaign measurement and analysis overall. Thank you. And speaking of uh, measurement, we have a question from Max. He wants to know what kind of ROI measures can be applied to harvesting efforts. Are there different metrics that should be applied? Andrew, I think you're much more familiar with a lot of the benchmarking data that's out there. I'm going to let you yeah, I that one. Like in terms of uh, specific metrics, I, I think, um, you know, as I mentioned, by industry there are you know, specific sales nature, nurturing stats about how many touches it takes. Um, so I, I would try to uh, look at, depending on what, what industry you're in, and see if you can find any sort of like companies or um, specific industry data. Um, I think also um, that the types of types of campaigns that are working. Um, there's no sort of general one rule of thumb that uh, sales nurturing or harvesting efforts uh, generate 30% ROI. I think what you will find though is come up with some good benchmarks and, and how many times it typically takes, um, whether you're trying to reach a CFO or CIO, um, I think you will be able to find some benchmarks that you can build into your campaigns and, and factor into your sales nurturing or harvesting efforts. Thanks, Andrew. Our next question is from Liz. Can similar harvesting strategies be applied to folks who register for a web seminar but aren't able to make the live event? Should they be approached differently than the live attendees or even those that download an on-demand version? Well, uh, the, the people who register who attend, um, but then don't attend, uh, you know, uh, they're incredibly valuable, um, and you need to make sure that they get access to that recorded um, version of of the webcast. Uh, you know, the, the people who register to view it online, um, you know, they're of course not, in, in my opinion, anyway, they're they're not as they're not going to be not as valuable to you as the people who actually attend the event because you don't know right off the bat how much of the webcast that they viewed in that, that recorded version. If they skipped ahead, um, you know, they're, they're definitely worth a, a follow-up call because there was something in the content that um, was worth listening to. But you might want to qualify the ones who just view the, the recorded version. Um, you might want to qualify them a little bit before you pass them on to sales as a qualified lead and find out how much of the webcast they viewed or, or um, you know, what they're Try to just gauge what their, their, their true level of interest in it. But, you know, obviously the, the most valuable um, lead is the person who actually logged into that webcast and, and stayed for the whole thing. Yeah, I would agree. I think in terms of prioritization, um, as Jason alluded to, you probably want to focus immediately on the people who have took the time to attend the live event in terms of maybe have a turn over to your sales team right away. Uh, but I think it is critical to have some harvesting sales nurturing effort that's targeted for people that have have raised their hand and said, yes, I am interested in this topic, whether they attended the live event or an on-demand version, have some um, offer ready to some follow-up messaging ready to, to provide that's either further content or other relevant content on a similar topic. Uh, but I think you can have a similar strategy to make sure you're following up with all those folks. Uh, thank you, and I'd like to just add a little something there um, that, you know, whatever webcasting platform you're using should be able to record how long a person 
uh, stayed on the webcast. And that does give you an indication of the level of interest. They log on and stay for only five minutes or you know, even if they stay for half an hour, that's going to tell you, well, maybe they had a meeting to go to or something came up that they were interested. So um, how long they stay on is really gives you a good indication of the level of interest. So let's move on to the next question, which is from Rita. What type of campaigns offer more harvesting opportunities? You know, as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of, of webcasting because it gives you the opportunity to send multiple emails out in advance of the event. Um, it gives you the opportunity to, to capture the people who actually go and attend the event. And then it creates some killer content that you can market with after the event. So, you know, webcasting is a great one. Um, white papers, I, I have a lot of success with white papers um, just because, you know, if, if you were to send out an email campaign um, promoting a white paper, you're probably going to get a lot more registrations than you would um, for a webcast, for example. And, you know, just out of the sheer volume, you're, you're going to get some good luck with it. Um, you know, but the thing about that I don't like about white papers is that you send that one email campaign and then you can't do anything with it again. It doesn't give you the chance to really touch them again because if you send them that same content again, you know, hey, that white paper is still available, then you're just um, uh, becoming redundant. Um, Andrew, do you have a, a preference? You know, I think the other strong thing about webcasts, you alluded to it, Jason, it, it does put you in a position to then offer ongoing uh, content. So I've seen some people do some really smart things with, okay, you were interested in this topic, you attended the, the seminar, here's a white paper, here's a research report, here's an executive briefing, all on the, on the topic. So, you know, once they've engaged with you and then shown some interest, you know, a web seminar can really launch you into a lot of the other mediums very comfortably. You know, another thing I, uh, I like about this kind of rich content sharing, um, it gives you the opportunity to maybe capture a little bit of more information about um, your prospects as they register. Um, you know, the, the statistics that I've seen just in, in practice on my own, um, if the content that I'm sharing is a white paper, the amount of information I can get from the person is, is, is relatively low. Um, I mean, and I, the, the abandonment rates, um, if they had a, a pay-per-click campaign advertising a white paper and you set up to your landing page and you ask them for 16 bits of information before they can get that white paper, you're either going to get a bunch of information that's incorrect and, and false, or you're going to get people who just bounce off the page altogether and don't share anything with you. Um, the, the value of the content can sort of dictate the amount of information that you can ask for. And the more touches you have with them, the more information you can gather about them along the way. Um, so while I have my preferences about which types of campaigns I like to run, um, you can't run only one type of campaign. That makes sense. Um, I'd like to uh, wrap this up to be respectful of everyone's time today and say th thank you very much to Andrew and Jason for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And I would also like to thank the audience for their time and attention. We hope you will join us again for another On24 event.